Hello fellow lemon scratchers! It's been ages since our space shooter project Lemonoids had an update, and I know many of you have since taken it upon yourselves to extend and upgrade this project in very exciting ways. Wow man, that is so awesome, I love it. Like this exciting project, Potatoid by CoolCats80. The power-ups work especially well. What we are going to focus on in this tutorial will be adding an opening title menu. A play button with smooth scene transitions will polish up the sprite layering, taking the pain out of keeping everything in the intended layer order. Our player can finally take damage too. Ouch! And so they'll need their own health bar. And then it's game over, dude! This is all super cool and really helps to polish off the whole game experience. So awesome! Are you ready to take Lemonoids to the next level? Oh boy, yes! So, our last official episode was episode 3, but since then there have been two tutorials posted on this channel that we will be making use of today. Amazing health bars and awesome number counters. So before you will be able to follow along further, do make sure you have completed both of these episodes. There's a link to them both in the description under this video. Now amazing health bars, it was a bonus episode of Lemonoids so hopefully you'll already have this in your game. But I didn't officially add awesome number counters to Lemonoids. Although I know a lot of you already did, good job guys, you know who you are. Anyhow, today I will show you exactly how to add it in. So when you have the completed number counters project, make sure to open up your backpack and drop the score sprite right in there. All ready to go. Oh yeah, this is going to be great. Okay guys, it's time to open up our part 3 Lemonoid projects with the bonus health bars already in place I hope. And before we go any further, go to the file menu and make sure to save this as a new copy. This is episode 4. Guys, let's get scratching! So we are going to begin by officially adding the player score. With the number counter sprite safely in our backpack, this is going to be super easy. Drag the sprite into the Lemonoid project like so. And right away, if we run the project by clicking the green flag, our score pops right up like this. Brilliant. We'll just be wanting to make the score increase when we shoot the lemons. But just before that, click into the player sprite because it's always important to reset our variables when the game begins. If you look in our variables, a new variable has appeared named score. This is a for all sprites variable that came as part of the number counter sprite. We're going to want to set score to zero and just drop it in before the feather game loop begins. Great, our score will start at zero. Now we can work on our lemon sprite. Find the define enemy hit script. So obviously this gets triggered when an enemy is hit by our laser. So we can simply change score by one. Do that right at the top of this script. So every successful hit will give us a point and we can run the project. Wow! And wow, I love how easy that was to get working. This drop-in number counter is indeed awesome, loving it. Of course, we can extend this further. For example, why not give the player an extra big reward for destroying a big lemon? We can do that by duplicating the change score and dropping it in here within the if size is greater than 250. This is where the large lemon gets destroyed. So change score by not one, but yeah, 10. Just checking that out. Yeah, no problem. Now perhaps you might find this score a little bit big on the screen. It is rather in your face, right? If you wanted to shrink it down just a touch, then click into the score sprite. And this 100 number is the size we need to change. We can make it any size we like. Whoa! Oh. Uh, let's go for 65. Now the only problem with this is that having changed the size of the score, the score animation is now rather over exaggerated. No problem, this too can be easily fixed. That's controlled by the number here in the define change costume 2 block, so drop that back to something like 90%. That is much better. Yeah, I like that. Score achieved. And that brings us nicely onto our next topic, GUI layering. Now that's GUI or G-U-I, it stands for Graphical User Interface, and this includes anything like buttons and text on our screen. In this case I'm talking about the score, 
and how it's not floating in front of the player or the lemon health bars, and that looks plain wrong. All GUI elements should be brought right to the front. So starting with the score sprite itself, when the game starts, we create six new clones to represent each digit of our score. All these want to come to the front. So under the when I start as clone hat block, it would make sense to drop in a fresh go to front block. And that will ensure each one is brought in front of all the other game's sprites. Seems logical. So run the project and take a look. Yeah, the player is now nicely behind the score. But hold on, did you see that? We have not been so lucky with the health bars. Now the problem here is that health bars themselves are considered GUI elements, and as such are also competing to be at the front. Look, click into the health bar sprite, and as you might have expected, here under their when start as clone blocks, they too have a go to front. And since these health bars are actually cloning all the time over and over, that's the way they work, then they are always jumping to the front no matter what. Hmm, problem. To solve this puzzle, we just have to remember that the only thing we want in front of these health bars are those six score clones. So after this health bar clone jumps to the front, if we were to immediately shuffle it back by six layers with a go back layers block, then that would naturally restore it to behind the score clones. <laughs> nice plan. But rather than using the number six, we would be wise to make a new variable to store this number in. Name it GUI layers and make it for all sprites. Then if we do need more user interface sprites in front, we have the power to change this while the game is running. So drop the new variable into the go backwards block like so. Cool, we're going to front and then shuffling back behind the GUI elements. Great, now to set the number of elements. Click into the player sprite and under the green flag script, we'll set GUI layers to just zero as no score sprite has yet to be cloned. Drop it in right at the top after going to the front. Okay, to ensure our score sprite gets cloned in the right order to update this variable, we'll bring in a broadcast block right after setting it to zero and broadcast the new message set up score clones. Now to hook this up, click into the score sprite and we'll replace the when flag clicked with the new when I receive setup score clones event receiver. Cool. That means these won't begin cloning until we are ready for them. Now to add up the required number of GUI clones. This is super easy. When I start as a clone and move to the front, then right away change GUI layers by one. This will happen once for each score clone and should then add up to six. If we run the project now, yeah, there we go. GUI layers is indeed equal to six. So the proof will be in the pudding. If I can just get a health bar to move over the score. Yes, there we go. The health bars are moving back by six layers behind the score clones. Beautiful and clean. Managing sprite and clone orderings in Scratch is never an easy task, but this does the job for us here. But if your project needs further help with crazy sprite ordering, then make sure to check out my tutorial on sprite layering as that has the most amazing solution for this ever. Anyhow, back to lemonoids. Our next goal will be to add player health. And this is well overdue because what sort of space shooter game is this without it? Since we already have the health bar sprite, we can use this again for our player. The health bar sprite has this handy custom block named show health that we can drag out into any sprite we want to endow with a health bar. So drag it now to our player sprite. Then click back into the player sprite, and there it is, splatted on top of all my other scripts. Just move it into some free space. Okay, that's safely in place. Come back to the green flag script because before we can use this show health block, we need to define how much health this player actually has. We'll need some new variables. Name the first one max health for this sprite only and click OK. Now my player will start with a health of 50. So set max health to 50. Then to store the current health, make another variable named health. Again for this sprite only. 
Of course, health must begin fully charged, so set health to max health, and then move the two blocks to be grouped with the lower set of game initialising set blocks. Perfect, health will now be starting at 50. Now to manage collisions and the player's health. Scroll down to our main game loop. This forever loop here. You can see we have custom blocks for the different actions we need to take, and we now need a new one for checking for the player's collisions and managing the player's health. Make a new custom block named Check Player Collisions. Tick to run without screen refresh. We can drop this new block into the bottom of our forever loop. And that frees us up to work on the defined block itself. Nice and simple. If this player sprite is touching a lemon sprite, then boom, we are in trouble. Change health by. And not positive one, but negative one. This is bad news for us. And here we go. Now we can drag in our very handy show health block. But make sure to place it below the if, as this wants to be displayed whether we are colliding or not. And all we do is fill in the current health and the max health, and then in the offset, pick a number like negative 30 to show the bar below this sprite. Oh, cool! I am excited to see this in action. There's not so many backpackable sprites that can be just thrown into a project and be up and running so easily. But the score and the health bar sprites. They are the real deal. Yeah, this player health bar is working great, draining fast while I'm in contact with a lemon. But it is a little underwhelming, don't you think? There's not enough visual feedback that I'm actually getting damaged here. We can first go with changing the player to be a white silhouette like we do when the lemons get hurt. So set brightness to 100 as soon as the player is touching the lemon. Then, to ensure we don't stay bright forever, duplicate the set brightness to before the if check and set it to a brightness of zero. If we run that and collide with a lemon, then yes, we now appear white. That's cool. But still, it's not so inspiring. Uh, look at the cool effects we get when shooting lemons. There's all that nice particle pops. How about we make use of these again? If you click into the lemon sprite, under the enemy hit script, you'll find that to spawn a new explosion particle, we are adding three numbers to the bang list. The first is the type of particle. This can be a one or a two at present, I believe. And then we add the X position and Y position that the particle should be spawned at. Nice. Let's use this in the player sprite. So when we have collided with a lemon and after we change health by negative one, Drop in the three new add to boom blocks, keeping them just the same. Type one and positioned at the sprites X and Y positions. Run the project and let's see how that mixes things up. Okay, now that's better. It just needs to be a little more turbulent perhaps. We'll mix up the positions of the particles with an addition block. And on the right, a pick random number between minus 10 and 10. This will shift the position erratically. We need two of these, one for the X position, pop that back into the add block, and one for the Y position. Let's give it a spin. I'm expecting this to look way more cool. And yes, I'm not disappointed. What do you think? The icing on the cake will be to get some sound in here. Now, hopefully you still have the all sound sprite, if not, then the sounds were also used in the lemon sprite. Uh, the ones I'm after are called Explosion 2 and Explosion 18. If you'd be so kind as to drag them into the player sprite, then we can continue. Start sound, Explosion 2. And we drop it in to start playing as soon as we know we have made a collision. Here we go. Yeah, sweet! And now I know we are losing health for sure. Good job. So, wow, we have lost a lot of health. Our health variable is showing negative 233. That sure is a good indicator that we should have exploded a long time ago. And that poses an interesting new problem here. Scrolling up to our main game loop, you can see that this is coded to continue forever. Well, no longer. Bring in a repeat until block. 
This game loop will stop as soon as the player's health drops below 1. Health is less than 1. Now swap the script from the forever loop into the new repeat loop. And goodbye forever, hello repeat. Great, so now when our health is low enough, the game loop will end and we'll arrive down here. And we are going to want to do something quite dramatic. A really cool end of game player explosion, right? So we begin by hiding the player sprite. Next up, we're going to animate a number of explosions. So use a repeat loop, repeating perhaps seven times over. Then we'll start playing the explosion 18 sound. That's the big one. And while this happens, let's spawn some new explosion particles. Okay, find those add to bang list blocks. Here we go. Duplicate these up here under the start sound, but switch the initial add one for an add two, as we want the larger Godray explosions this time around. Oh yeah. Perhaps we shouldn't be adding this random turbulence to the position this time round either. Uh, switch back to just the X and Y positions as they were. And one final effect, the camera shake. To get this, all we need to do is broadcast shake. Love it. Then, to give us time to appreciate all the work we've done, plop in a wait block at the last block in the repeat for 0 0.1 seconds. That's one tenth of a second. Do you want to see this in action? I sure do. So let's get our health down. And boom, boom, boom. This is seriously more like it. Those lemons seriously kick butt. And we are a goner. To continue, we need to press the green flag and everything starts off again. Now, this is a legitimate way to restart a Scratch project. I've seen it done a million times, but it would be way cooler if we have a proper ending and a way to restart the game without restarting the entire project. So, how about once the game is ended, we start by fading the gameplay to black. This can be triggered after the repeat loop has ended, but first, a little pause, using a wait one second. And then, broadcast the new message splash screen. This will fade us to black and then bring up the splash screen, that is, the title screen. To fade to black, we need to make a fresh new sprite. Name it Curtain. This is often the name we give to a layer that will cover the entire screen, like the curtain of a theatre. We need a fully black rectangle, so switch to bitmap mode and use the fill tool to blacken out the entire canvas. Just so. The coding of this is quite straightforward. When flag clicked, hide the curtain. But when we receive the splash screen event, we want to fade the black curtain in, in front of all the other sprites. Begin by making sure it is covering the entire stage using a go to X0 and Y0. Next, ensure it begins fully transparent by setting its ghost effect to 100. Fully ghosted out. Of course, the curtain must be in front of all the other sprites and clones, so go to front layer. Ah, but what about all those gooey layers sprites, huh? Does the curtain want to be in front of the score? No, it does not. We want to continue to see our score after the game has ended. That's important, as the player will want to know how well they did. So go backwards by gooey layers, as before. But we don't quite stop there. This black curtain itself needs to be counted as a gooey element, so that the health bars don't get moved in front of it too. So right after moving the sprite to the correct layer, we then change gooey layers by one to include this curtain sprite too. Finally, make sure to show the curtain. But the curtain is still fully ghosted. We need to fade it gradually into view. Drag in a repeat block, and I find a repeat of 20 is a good amount of time for these kinds of transitional animations. Changing ghost effect by, and now to fade our black curtain all the way to solid black, we'd want to change ghost by negative five. However, instead I'm going to opt to change it only by negative two. This will have the effect of only partially darkening the screen instead. Testing that quickly now, and here comes the darkening. Yes, did you see that? Lemons and their health bars are both darkened as they are safely behind our dark curtain. 
thanks to our GUI layers variable. But importantly, the score is still perfectly bright in the foreground. Nice work. Right, I hope you are feeling artistic. Next up, we need to get creative to design our awesome title screens for our games. It's going to look amazing on this darkened background, I'm sure. We can start by duplicating the curtain sprite as that has the same basic structure, and name it Logo. Jump right into the costume editor and make a fresh costume for our cool design. The old costume can be deleted. The basis for our logo will of course be the words Lemonoids, but I leave to you the fun job of designing your logo just the way you want it. And there, I have my logo. I can't wait to see yours too. I love scrolling down the project studio and checking out all the title screens. The creativity of you guys just blows me away, it's so exciting. Okay, back to the code. So, this splash screen event will occur at the same time as our black curtain fade, but I really want the logo to fade in just a little bit later, so perhaps wait half a second, 0.5, before doing anything at all. Next up, look here, yes, we want to bring the logo to the front, but unlike the curtain, it should stay in front, so chuck away the move back block. But do keep the change GUI layers by one, as this logo is kept in front of the health bars. I'm just going to push the logo a tiny bit higher on the screen to make way for the play game button below. And lastly, the fading in repeat loop at the bottom needs a tweak. We want to fully fade our logo in, so we must change the ghost effect by negative 5. 5 is 100, a full fade. Yes, 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 it's time to see our work in its full glory. Smash the green flag and proceed to lose all our health. Boom! Here comes the fade. And in comes the logo. Oh man, that looks great. And see how having the black outline on our text makes it show up super cool against the faded lemons. I love that so much. And of course, our score is still prominent, which is perfect when you want to check out how well you did. And then. Then we'll want to let the player click to play again. But for this we'll need a new way to begin our game, other than just triggering off the green flag. Let's take a look at the player sprite and find the when green flag click script. Yeah, this is where it all begins. But now, rather than launching straight into our game, we might as well trigger the splash screen. That would be way cooler. Ok, so we need to identify what should run at startup and what runs later once the play button is clicked. Keep these top blocks to set up the score clones, but everything below can be separated off for later. We don't want the player visible on the title screen, so make sure to hide them here. Then, to trigger the title screen, all we need is the broadcast splash screen, just like we do when the game ends. Hey, that basically should do the job. Smash the green flag and see how the game starts up. Now, of course, we begin with no lemons so we don't see the fade effect, but it's all nice and clean looking. And what's also cool is that the lemon scripts do actually kick off as if we were playing in the background, and that means the lemons start to drift into view, and I really like that. It makes the title screen feel more dynamic and gives you a feel for the game. Well, great! All we need now is the start game button. The main game loop scripts are still floating around without a hat block. Here, let's attach a new when I receive event hat to that stack, and give it a new event name of new game. Super, we'll use this later, because that sets us up perfectly to add a cool start game or play button, whatever you want to call yours. So again, we'll duplicate the last sprite we made, the logo sprite, and name it play. Now this button will be positioned lower down, like around here I think. So in the costume editor, start a new costume. I want to have the button use the same colour as my Lemonoids spaceship. So select the part of the costume of that colour, and then come back to our new sprite and the colour swatches retain the same colours. Useful! So I'll draw a nice rectangle for the button, sizing and snapping it to the centre of the canvas, add the text label play thickening it up and adding a nice shadow effect, and lastly I'll give the button a border, and then use the shape tool to add straight line points to each side. Great, with that made, let's check out the code. 
as with the logo. Let's delay this play button even longer, perhaps a full second after the splash screen event. The position is about right on screen, so update the go to with a negative 100 for the Y. All the other scripts will work OK, so let's run that to see how it looks so far. Yeah, so the title comes first and then the play button quickly follows, and that looks good. But we can make it better still by animating it to entice clicks. So start by switching this repeat loop for a forever loop. So we want the button to gradually grow and shrink in size, so bring in a set size block. The start size will be 100%, so we use an addition block with 100 on the left. Then on the right, add a multiply block. We'll pulsate bigger and smaller by 3%, so enter that in here. But the actual pulsating is given by the sign of operator. In the right of the sign, we need a timer, but Scratch's timer is too slow by default, so multiply timer by 180 within the sign block. <laughs> That's it. Drop it into the size block. Remember, we have the original size, 100, the throb size, 3, and the throb speed, 180. Simple enough, and a very useful little Scratch script. Let's see that in action, shall we? Yeah, can you see the throb? It's a good speed, but it's a little bit too subtle. We can play around with the throb size until we're happy. And yes, I'm liking 10 much better. Finally, how about a little hover feedback when the mouse is over the button? We can do that with an if else block in the same forever loop, checking if the button is touching the mouse pointer. If it is touching, then the mouse is over the button, so set the button's brightness to 15. Otherwise, we want to make sure it's set back to the default brightness of zero. Testing again, and there you go, a very simple mouse hover effect. Nice. So all that remains is to make it clickable. In some free space, drag in a when this sprite clicked block. You could drop in a cool sound here if you liked, but I don't have one to hand, so I'm just going to make it flash. Set brightness effect to 100. Pow! White out, see? Now I'd like to fade this back out again, but we have to be careful because this other forever loop in the same sprite is still running after we click, and that will undo the brightness effect right away. So to make sure this new click script runs uninterrupted, we can use a stop other scripts in sprite. That will stop this forever loop script, but leave the sprite clicked event running. So drop in a repeat 10 block and change brightness effect by negative 10. To bring it back down quickly to zero. If I click the block stack, you can see that in action, and that gives the button a nice quick flash effect. Perfect. Next, as the game begins, we'll need to fade out the title screen elements, so another repeat loop, this time for a count of 20, and instead of changing the brightness, we change ghost by 5 to fade the whole thing out. I can click it now to show you that working, but once faded out, I need to run the project to see it come back again. Cool, this is nice. Next up, we need to reset our game ready to play once more. But we don't want to just delete all the on-screen lemons, that wouldn't look so great. So instead, let's take our black curtain and use it to smoothly fade the lemons away to nothing. Then at that point we'll be free to delete them and reset the game. We'll trigger the reset using a broadcast block just after the when sprite clicked event is triggered. And we'll name it reset game. Now click back into the curtain sprite and we'll need a matching when I receive reset game event receiver. We're going to now fade to fully black. So copy the repeat loop that previously faded us partway, and this time we change the amount to negative 5 for a full fade to black. Great, run the project. We are looking for the lemons to now fully fade to black. So here goes. Wow, yeah, they certainly did, and really quite fast. You might like to make that slower. But before we cast judgement, let's also get the logo fading out too. Click into the logo sprite. When I receive reset game. 
Let's just wait a moment, 0.2 seconds perhaps. And then as a safeguard, drop in a stop other scripts in Sprite, just in case the other repeat loop was still running. Now we'll have our normal repeat 20, with a change ghost effect by 5, positive 5. Because we are now ghosting this logo out rather than fading a black in. Here, let me click the script so that you can see it fading away. Yeah, there you go. Cool. So once the logo has faded away, there's no point keeping it in front of all the other layers. So how about we go to the back layer and equally then change GUI layers by negative one. Yep, one less GUI element to worry about. We have to do this because otherwise when the splash screen event runs later on, we'd be adding to the GUI layers again and that would not balance out. But it will now. While we are at this then, let's do the same with the play button sprite. Back in the when sprite clicked script. After it's faded out, send it to the back, go to back layer, and then change GUI layers by negative one. But here's something new. We then want to trigger our game to finally begin once more. And luckily we already added an event receiver for this. So broadcast, yes, that was it. New game, woohoo! We are nearly there. At this point, the main game loop will begin. But the black curtain is still hiding the entire game behind its eternal darkness. And our lemon clones are still hanging around and need resetting. Let's sort that first. In the lemon sprite, drop in a when I receive new game. This triggers after the curtain is fully black and the lemons are hidden. The perfect time to just delete all those lemon clones. And since all the clones receive this event, all the clones will delete themselves. All except the original lemon sprite, which is the hidden lemon cloning factory sprite. That one continues to spawn new lemons and the new game continues. Splendid! But the black curtain? It's still obscuring everything. Click into the curtain sprite and we'll fade the curtain away to reveal our player's ship as the game starts up. When I receive new game, repeat 20 and change ghost by not negative five, but positive five. That's right. We are making the black curtain more transparent until it's completely faded away. Ah, so this curtain was one of the gooey layers. So now it's gone. We'll go to back and change GUI layers by minus one. Ah, you know, I think that is everything. I can hardly believe it. It's time to give it a whirl. Smash the green flag and let's check out that play button in action. So once a lemon shows up, I'll click the play button and we'll watch for the fade out and the fade back in to a new game. Perfect. And that worked exactly as we wanted. The next thing we need to test is that once we die, the score and layers all continue to work consistently. Gotta say this is looking great. What do you think? Let's play another game. The fades are looking sweet. The score resets and yeah, very good. Again, it looks like our clones are fully under control as reported by scratch add-ons at the top here, always resetting to seven or eight clones as the game begins. Cool. Now, did you notice that as the game starts up, we show the score of zero? We could perhaps retain a high score using cloud data, or if you prefer to just hide the initial score, then in the player sprite, set score to the empty value before setting up the score clones. And there, the score is hidden. So it all just depends on what you prefer, doesn't it? And that is it. Our Lemonoids is actually looking like a real game. So as I talk you out, you can finally enjoy watching me take on Lemonoids for real and see how good a score I can get. Ha, this is really the first time I've ever played it for real. So it will be interesting. I do feel I'm pretty good at dodging these lemons by now. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please smash that like button. And if you haven't already, then do subscribe to the channel and click the notify me button so as not to miss my next exciting episode. As always, there's a link to the Scratch Studio in the description under the video. So get scratching and submit those projects so we can all see what you've achieved. 
I can't wait. There's so much potential to take this game in awesome directions with power-ups, timers, bosses, other types of enemies. Wow! Come on guys, let's see what you can do. So thank you for watching, have a most awesome week ahead, and scratch on guys.